Good afternoon. This is November 2nd, 1998. We're here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts, and we have the um, pleasure of interviewing this afternoon Mr. Vinjal T. Laza, and this is an interview in conjunction with our Veterans Oral History Project. Good afternoon, Mr. Laza. Good afternoon. Did I pronounce your first name correctly? Good enough. And how do you pronounce it? It's uh, Vinjal. Vinjal. In Albanian, it's Vanjo. Okay. <laughs> and may I ask you how old you are? 77. You're 77 years old. And your current address? Uh, 13 LaGrange Street, Natick. And how long have you lived there? Uh, let's see. I, I moved there in 1976. Was and, that 22 years? Okay. And your current marital status? Single. You're single. And where were you born? Natick. Raised in, and born in Natick. Born and born raised? Born and raised. In Natick. Yeah. And where were you raised? What street were you? Summer Street. Summer Street in Natick. Right. And did that area have a nickname? Well, that was part of the Navy Yard. Part of the Navy Yard. Right. And did you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I had a brother. He was in the Navy. Was he in the Navy yeah. um, during the same time that you were in the service? No, he went in after me. Mm -hmm. And what was his name? Andrew. Andrew. And tell us about your parents. They came from Albania. <clears throat> My father came over in uh, 1907. He made, he got a job, made some money, then he went back. He got married, then he came back again. And then he sent for my mother and my sister. And that was 1920. So in 1920, your family came over here as a family unit. That, yeah. And then were you born here after they yeah, arrived? That's right, 20, 1921. What was Natick like growing up in the 20s and 30s? It was a very, very quiet town. I think there was like 8,000 people. If that was that much, and uh, I, have, I also remember when they used to uh, uh, plow the plow the streets with a horse and carriage, you know, or whatever it was. Did you come from a close knit community on Summer Street? Oh yes. Everybody was friendly towards everyone uh, everybody. else. Everybody. Was it a mixed background? <clears throat> all of ethnic groups. All ethnic yeah. groups. And did your parents speak English? No. Mm -hmm. So were you raised in a household where you went to school and learned English? That's right. And then and out you, on the street with the kids. You would speak English out yeah, on the street yeah. and you would speak Albanian at home? That's right. Mm -hmm. And you went to the Natick schools? Uh, I went to uh, Wilson School, first grade. Then I went to the Kennedy, uh, Lincoln, the old Lincoln School. And the old Lincoln School was where? Where the telephone company is now. Okay, and that is on the corner of Grant Street and Route 135. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there I went to Coolidge Junior High. Which is now the uh, Senior yeah. Citizens Housing. Then I went over here to the high school and at the town hall. The, the town hall, which we should mention, is going to be torn down in the next yeah. month. But that was your high school. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then after high school, what did you do? Well, let's see, I graduated in 1940. Uh, I used to help my father at, his, at work. <clears throat> he was a shoemaker. And was he a shoemaker in Natick? No, in Newton. Mm -hmm. uh, well, 1940, after I graduated, we moved to Newton. And I used to help him there. And uh, that's, where, that's where I was. Uh, drafted from Newton. And how old were you when you were drafted? 21. And, and you were single? Right. Were you drafted with friends? No, just, well, it was a group there, but I didn't know too many people in Newton. And when you were drafted, what branch of the service were you drafted into? The Army Air Force. And where did you do your basic training? Basic training was in Atlantic City. Now we lived in uh, 
hotels. But uh, we used to do, come on the street there with uh, that hotel that we were in is, is today, the Valley. There was no casinos then. Okay. And uh, we used to do our calisthenics out in the street. Then we'd march down the boardwalk. And there was a field there where we used to do our uh, right face, left turn, you know, all that stuff. All the marching. Oh, yeah, all our marching. And how, how large was your group, approximately? Gee, I don't know. Mm -hmm. That was like a class, you know. Mm -hmm. And how long did the training last? I think it was like uh, two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. And then from there, from there, they sent me to uh, Roosevelt Field. And where was that? In Long Island. That's uh, to learn uh, airplane engine mechanic. Is this because they saw a specialty while you were in BASIC that you were good at? Well, when we were in uh, Atlantic City, we took all kinds of tests there. Mm -hmm. you know, they, and uh, that's so they sent me there. So how long were you in Long Island? Uh, let's see. Approximately. I went there in, uh, I don't know, two or three months. And from there, they sent me to uh, uh, Detroit, uh, Rolls-Royce Engines. So were you at a factory in Detroit? The Packard. The Packard yeah, factory? Yeah, the old Packard, yeah. They were making the Rolls-Royce engines. Are these the engines that were being used for the airplanes? For the fighter planes, yeah, for uh, uh, P P-51s, uh, Spitfire, Mosquito. There was a well, uh, there was many planes that used it. So you were learning basic intricacies of the engine. Yeah, we took them apart and put them together, mm -hmm. and learned all what they made off and so forth. And once you were finished in Detroit, where did you go? That's when we went to Westover Field. Westover in Massachusetts? In Massachusetts, yeah, near Springfield there. And did you continue with more training there? Well, that's what we were, <clears throat> we had our own planes that we were taking care of. And uh, the pilots used to come in and learn how to fly the P-50, P I mean the P-47s. Because we had P-47s first. Uh, and. Uh, then they'd move on to some place else, and more pilots had come in. And so we, the pilots were training at Westover, and you were getting experience fixing the plane. That's right. And how long did that last? I think it was like seven months. Seven months. Mm -hmm. While you were doing this, and this was in mid-1940s? Uh, well, 42. Yeah, that's when I went and then I think I think it was like uh, geez, uh, well right right after it was right, right after that that I was uh, at Westover Field and I would say about seven months. And while you were training on mechanics, were you hearing any? Uh, were you getting any types of information about what was happening overseas or in different parts of the world with regards to the war? Well, yeah, whatever, whatever that was, we heard them. How would you hear about it? Would you hear through uh, magazines or newspapers? Did you get the um, Stars and Stripes back yeah, then? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Were you with a group that was anxious to go over and help? Did you want to go overseas? I was going to do whatever they wanted me to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a typical day at Westover, tell us a little bit about what well, time you'd get up, what you'd do. We used to get up like uh, 5.30, have breakfast, and we'd go down the line where the pl our planes are, <clears throat> and we'd uh, warm them up, check them all around, you know, daily inspection. It was a daily inspection, a 25-hour inspection, a 50-hour inspection, and a 100-hour inspection. We, differed, we do different things. 
So these hours were hours in flight? That's right. After 25 hours in flight, you would inspect it thoroughly yeah. again? Mm -hmm. And after Westover, after seven months in Westover, what did you do? Uh, we went to uh, Seymour Johnson Field in uh, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where uh, people, Seymour uh, Johnson Field was a school for mechanics. And they were coming out of there and we'd be leaving, going to the different uh, uh, of different organizations, the units that they were getting ready to uh, send overseas. Mm -hmm. So did you have the sense that your time was getting short to go overseas? Well, yeah, we all knew that. And when did you finally go overseas? Uh, I think it was like in uh, January 44. Uh, we went to well, Mauritania. There was a British ship. Mm -hmm. And we went all over, there was like 10,000 GIs on there. And we went, uh, they had a zigzag all over the Atlantic, you know. We always heard rumors about the submarines that were uh, tracking us. <laughs> so you would zigzag so they wouldn't they, hit they, you? Yeah. Well, they knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. How long were you at sea? I think it was like nine days. And where did you land? Uh, we, we came around the island and we went to Liverpool. Liverpool in England? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were you glad to see land at that point? Oh, <laughs> I'll say. What do you remember most about your ship experience? Not, not too much. We, we were all crowded in there. Mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> That's all. I just remember being crowded in that ship. It's always uh, trying to make you sick. Mm -hmm. And once you landed in Liverpool, did you see the devastations of war firsthand? No, we didn't see any there. Mm -hmm. But I remember the guys were saying, what a dump this place is. <laughs> really? Not what they expected? So, well, you know, that's what we used to all say when we went someplace. Mm -hmm. And how long were you stationed in Liverpool? Oh, we, we were there like uh, overnight. I went to uh, uh, the air base, uh, Andover Haunts, they call it. In England? In England, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's where we formed our, our uh, squad. But we had formed it already when we were in Connecticut. That's why I forgot that we were in Connecticut there for a while forming uh, our unit. A squadron. And so the squadron would be formed in the states and then stay together yeah. and go overseas That's as right. a unit yeah. and work together. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're at this area in England and setting up the squadron there. Yeah. What would the squadron include? Pilots? Oh, yeah. Usually how many pilots were in your squadron? Well, each squadron had a... I forgot like 25 planes and 25 pilots and we had three that we had p-38 so uh, uh, there was three men to each plane three crew members I mean uh, maintenance men so you were part of a three-man group to take care of that's right one plane yeah mm -hmm. each plane had three men so it was really your responsibility to make sure that the plane was ready and able to and carry it. the pilot and how, however many others. was this, I'm not familiar with what type of plane this was. The P-38 has uh, got uh, two engines and uh, with a pilot, as they call that, the, the gondola or the nasal. And then it, it's got two booms that come and connect to a to the tail and the wing. And the pilot is the only one in the plane? That's all. What did you experience? Did you form friendships with these pilots? Well, yeah, some of them. Mm -hmm. We weren't that close, though. Because you were busy fixing the planes? Well, we had our, our own pilot that was assigned to that plane. Mm -hmm. And. In England, you had mentioned um, 
the area Andover haunts. That's where we were, yeah. That's, that field was so big that it had about five or six planes taken off at once. At the same time? Yeah. What was it like when you realized that some of these planes weren't coming back? I know. It. Was that difficult for you and for some of the people in your squadron? Mm -hmm. And h how long were you in Andover, Hans? Well, uh, until, uh, until the, the invasion, and then uh, we were, after the invasion, uh, we were there about uh, 20 more days and we went over to, we landed on Omaha Beach. So you, when you mention the invasion, you mention? The day. And that was with regards to the landings in yeah. France. Right. So you had to go then to France after the invasion. We had to get our planes, you know, they were, the engine, we had to wait for the engineers to make uh, these landing strips. And we were the, we were the head echelon. When our planes came in, we'd take care of them until the rest of the guys came over. So you were literally seeing landing fields made so that you could work yeah. and planes could land. Yeah. And how often would you move from one landing field to another? I think we only moved, uh, uh, let's see, once. We, well, our planes had to be close to the front lines. So in case uh, uh, there was a snag there, they they go down and bomb that place, so the our boys could get through. So on a typical week, where you're taking care of the plane, how often would your plane go out? Probably went out every day. Every day, and how long would it be gone? Would it differ each day? Well, when we were in England, they used to be gone like uh, four or five hours. Mm -hmm. And then they'd come back, and was it your responsibility to work on that plane immediately? Yeah, we, uh, you know, make sure it had enough gas and it was, everything was uh, all right on it. You know, we'd check around, see if any bullet holes or something. Mm -hmm. What were some of the most difficult experiences that you remember? having to take care of these planes and making sure these pilots were safe, at least in, in, in the equipment that you were giving them? I'd make sure everything was safe. Mm -hmm. The toughest experience was when I saw a plane crash right in front of me. And, uh, geez. and so there was injury or death right in front of you. And how old were you at that time? 21. So that was difficult for a young man oh, yeah. at the age of 21. Was this sort of the reality of war that really hit close to home? Hit you personally? Yeah. Hmm. Were you able to write home about it? Oh yeah, but they were sensitive, you know. Mm -hmm. You had to make sure, you had to watch what you, had, what you said. Sure. When you saw things like this happening, either a, a a plane crashing nearby or the plane not returning. Were, were any of these people that you had maintained friendships with and suddenly you realized they weren't coming back? Oh, we knew each other, yeah. You know. mm -hmm. Were you as a group in your squadron able to talk about it after it happened or did you see no point in talking about That's it? That's right. Because that was it, you know, that's what we expected. You know, you gotta, you gotta hope for the best. Mm -hmm. So when things like this happen, having something like that happen right in front of you, did you ever feel that your life was in danger when they were coming back with injured planes? No. Malfunctioning planes? No. And once you left England and arrived in France, did you see a lot there that also showed devastation with regards to oh, yeah. the landing? What did you see? 
I saw uh, hunger. Hunger. The, 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 the people, the population. Mm -hmm. When we eat and we throw the stuff away, they come right forward, try to grab it. So this would be young and old alike, some of the people in France who didn't have food? Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Were you able to befriend any of the people in France? We didn't stay long enough in mm -hmm. one place. And after, did you stay in France for the duration, or did you move forward? No, from, from France, uh, we went to uh, we went through Paris, Belgium. In Belgium, we were there uh, right uh, right until the, the Belgi Battle of the Bulge. At the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah. So you were in the thick of it. Well, yeah, they were right. They were coming right right at us. You know, we were at. Uh, uh, Florence, Belgium. That a, was a big air base there. And uh, all these tanks, our tanks, were cutting through to go to the Battle of Bulge. So these would be army tanks? Yeah. American army tanks? Oh, yeah. And th at that time, there was so foggy, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And we, our planes could get up. And I think it was like. Uh, just before Christmas, they cleared up. Our planes took off. When they take off, you could see a diving. That's how close they were. So they would be diving? At the Germans. So the Germans were that close to your airfield? Yeah. Were you ever frightened about that? All the time. All the time. So after Belgium, were you heading towards Germany at that point? Yeah, we went through Holland, <clears throat> then Germany. And Germany is where we saw a lot of devastation there. You did? Yeah. Was this beginning to be the end of the war? Yes. Did you know that? Well, we could feel it. Mm -hmm. And what was it like being in territory that you might assume was the territory of the enemy? How did I know I was in the enemy territory? What, what was it like for you? I was like, we just, like, uh, like as though we were anywhere else. Mm -hmm. we, knew it, we felt everything was under control. What, what was the difference with regards to some of the people who came near your campsite in France, as you had mentioned earlier, looking for food, the, and those we, in we Germany. We should give it to them, yeah. And what about in Germany? Well, uh, well we'd give it to them. If they just, but in France, when we were in, uh, uh, in Normandy there, there was this old woman, you know, they said, they reminded me of uh, my grandmother, you know, mm -hmm. had these uh, black kerchiefs on, and they'd come over and uh, they'd, they'd give them a loaf of bread, you know. Was it a sense that you couldn't complain about the bad food because you saw people around you that couldn't eat or didn't have food to eat? Mm. That's right. And when I mentioned the, the German um, population, were they a little hesitant to s come out and greet you, or what kind of atmosphere were you in? Well, they saw that you know we were happy-go-lucky, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, they came. They well, at first they were they were uh, leery of us, mm -hmm. but then they came out. Yeah. When you were going from. Um, area to area. Did you have to do a lot of walking? Were you on trucks? We were on trucks. You were on trucks. <clears throat> then when we were in Germany, we'd fly from one place to another. Mm -hmm. And how long were you in Germany for? Uh, let's see. Well, I, when, we got, we, when we got Germany, it was April. 
from 45. And uh, uh, we came to a, a place called uh, Munchen, and who was there, Eisenhower, with a whole bunch of military you know, guys, and him, him and some uh, English uh, generals. And uh, I said, who's that? Who's over there? He said, oh, that's Ike. <laughs> was there excitement oh, yeah. with your squadron knowing that Eisenhower was there? Well, it was, it was us mechanics. Mm -hmm. Were you able to talk to him? No. Couldn't mm -hmm. get near him. Now, what about General Patton? I know that he was probably in and around the area that you're yeah. talking about. I think our planes were the ones that were helping him, you know, if he came to him, uh, some obstruction, mm -hmm. they'd go there and bomb him so the tanks would get through. Now, you had mentioned earlier that when you arrived in Germany, they noticed that you were happy-go-lucky. Did your group try to maintain a sense of humor through all of this difficult time? Oh, we always did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was that your way of coping each day? Could have been, yeah. But we did it naturally. The American, young American boy, yeah. young American soldier. What do you feel were some of your, your biggest challenges throughout that time period? I don't know, so, so many. Mm -hmm. Name a few. Well, when I landed on Omaha Beach, I was thinking of all the the GIs who got killed there. And you had heard about that before you landed? Well, we knew it. You knew? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there were thousands. That's and right. Thousands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I, I remember we were in, in Belgium, and uh, it was sort of a buggy day. You know, it was a winter. It was very foggy, like up, you know, and we heard this noise, like a motorcycle up in the up in the sky. It was, it, we were saying, "Boy, that guy's got a rough engine." <laughs> it was a buzz bomb. And tell us what a buzz bomb is. It's a it's a, a plane that fl flies by its own own power. It's got a and then it when it finish, when it burns out, it dives and. It, they dove like a, they have, they have to guess where you are, you know. So is it a German buzz bomb? Yeah. And then when it dives, does it explode? Oh, well, yeah, that's mm -hmm. the that's, that's purpose. We were in England, we had our planes would try to meet them when they were coming across the channel and shoot them down. Mm -hmm. And were these unmanned? Unmanned, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they, I think that was a V1. I'm not sure. And you mentioned the fog. What what else do you remember about the weather at that time? Because you said it was. Correct me if I'm wrong. You said January. No. That's when I got there in January. I'm sorry, I April of '45. Well, you were in Germany. Yeah. Well then. Yeah, well, this is in 44 I'm talking about. Oh, all right. Mm -hmm. 44 is, uh, uh, well, when the Battle of Bulger began, it was so foggy you couldn't see nothing. And the Germans knew that. That's why they started their offensive. Uh, let's see. And then that's when, that's when we really got scared. Mm -hmm. Because you couldn't see and you didn't know yeah, what the was. Planes it. couldn't fly. But when that when that weather uh, cleared up, they all took off. And they all felt better. And for the most part, what do you remember about the weather over there? I know in some previous interviews, people were very clear about the cold, the wet, yeah. the mud. That's right. Do you remember things I do, specific? Yes. Uh, in uh, let's see, in France, 
Well, I remember the, the, the cold. That's when we were in Belgium. We were in tents. We had a fire and, you know, but I could still feel the cold. I couldn't sleep. And, uh, How was your health through all of this? Uh, it was great. Was there disease, though, that, that some of your um, other troop members would have to leave to be hospitalized or anything like that? Did that happen? Well, there was a lot of flu going on. Flu? Yeah. But all they did was they had some stuff, they'd paint your throat with it, and give you a couple of pills. And <laughs> Send you back. <laughs> Did you, were you able to maintain close friendships with any of these? Yeah, for a while, you know. You sent Christmas cards and... After you get out of the service. Yeah, then, that dies out. You know. mm -hmm. Do you know what happened to any of them when they came back? No, I don't. Once you finished, was Germany your last area in Europe? Yeah, that's right. And then were you flown out, or did you have to go back to England to ship out? No, we went uh, to Le Havre, France. And, and uh, we boarded the, uh, uh, what do you call it? It was the USS uh, West Point. We came back on that, and we landed in Virginia. And Newport News. What was your landing like? Do you remember being greeted, or was it a quiet oh, yeah. return? People, people, you know, happy to see us. You know, gave us a good welcome. What was it for all of you to feel coming back to the U.S. soil? I guess relieved. Mm -hmm. And at this point in time, you're how old? Mid twenties. Let's see, 40, 45, 24. Twenty-four years old. After Newport um, news, did you have to go back any place to be well, discharged? I had to go to uh, Fort Devens to get discharged. Were you able to let your family know you were coming back? Well, um, gee, I don't remember. <laughs> I must have. What was it feeling for you, knowing you were coming back, and, and did you come back to Newton or to Natick? To, New to Newton. That's where we were living at the time. Mm -hmm. And how did you feel, and how did your family feel about you coming home? Well, they, they were happy to see me. Mm -hmm. And at this point in time, did you have to turn right around and find work? Yes, I, I uh, went to work as an automobile mechanic. And then from there, uh, I was a mechanic for about eight years. Then I went to General Motors in Framingham. And I was there for 32 years. And did you retire from there? Yes. So would you say that military service not only helped you, but helped you in your career? It certainly did, yeah. It did. How do you feel the service and being in the military affected the rest of your life? I was proud to be in it. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that we do ask a number of our veterans is your opinion on the difference of public opinion regarding your generation in World War II versus um, the Korean conflict and those that served in the Vietnam War era. Would you like to comment on that? Well, I think that anybody that serves for, for our country should be respected. Do you feel that some in some of the branches of service during your generation or others were, came back and were not respected? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. 
And is there any one last thought or comment that you would like to leave with us or something that you haven't covered in this conversation that you'd like to talk about? I don't know. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll think about someone at home. <laughs> Sometimes that does happen. And if you do, by all means, we can add it to the tape. Uh -huh. We would like to thank you this afternoon for sharing your story okay. with us. I hope you have enjoyed it as much as we I have. Did. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.